close enough. It's time. So, all right, we'll go ahead and uh, get started. We're going to look at tornado climatology and the parameter climatology associated with uh, tornadic storms. This is based on work we've been doing at SBC over about the last six or seven years. Most of this is formally published at this point, so I'll just hit the highlights of it for you guys today. All right, we've got a big sample of convective mode cases where we looked at the entire CONUS, approximately 10,000 tornadoes over a multi-year period, and we assign convective mode looking at WSR88D reflectivity and velocity data, typically used at level two, and then we developed a whole bunch of spatial plots using kernel density estimates to come up with the frequency of occurrence of tornadic storms, various types of supercells, and various intensities of tornadoes. And then we've also got the SPC mesoanalysis data, which are, we can grab for the nearest grid point. So we, we can come up with a whole bunch of information and sort of piece this together, what it looks like spatially. So first, when we were dealing with convective mode, as you can see, this figure's a mess. <laughs> There's a whole bunch of different kinds of storms. I won't get into the details of how we classified each and every storm, but just suffice to say there's a whole bunch of different possibilities in close proximity, various forms of lines, clusters, and cells, supercell or not. We went through the painstaking, uh, tedious work of looking at every single severe thunderstorm event and trying to decide how did it fit into some spectrum here. All right, here's what it looks like when you break it down by convective mode. Uh, this one, if you look here, this would be the uh, cluster in discrete supercells, the strong peak that occurs typically in May and June. So discrete and cluster right-moving supercells that produce tornadoes are big shock. They're most common in the late spring, typically in the central United States. And you can see other modes, even uh, things that you get down into the QLCS, that peaks a little bit earlier in the spring and then the disorganized, which would be what some people might informally refer to as land spout producing storms, just cellular storms without supercell structure or linear structure, tend to peak later toward the core summer months. Well, we can break this down by relative frequency, just another way to look at this. And what it shows is if you follow the black line, this would be the discrete right moving supercells and the cluster ones, they tend to represent about a third of the cases as we go through the warm season months. It drops off in the winter a little bit and the dashed line would be QLCS where they become a higher fraction of all of the observed tornado cases. So QLCS tends to minimize late summer and fall. That's about when the disorganized storms maximize. And supercells just show a slow ramp up through the spring into the summer and then a gradual decay as we move into the fall. Now here's what it looks like when you smooth the data. This is again the roughly 10 years of uh, tornado reports, on maximum report on a 40 kilometer grid per hour. So we filtered out about 20% of the total tornadoes, but you do some pretty heavy smoothing and you can come up with essentially a corridor from Northern Alabama out to Kansas, Oklahoma, where you average anywhere from five to seven tornado days per decade within 40 kilometers of you. So this is pretty close. A tornadic storm will pass pretty close to any given point in here. It, and you could argue out here that would be well within view of you. You'd be able to see the storm go by and anywhere from five to seven times. So the peak is actually down in northern Alabama. And this does include the April 27, 2011 outbreak. So that peak is partly due to that, but not entirely. We can break it down by the various modes of storms and what it looks like spatially. Here, the discrete right moving storms, as you would expect, that's more of a central US phenomenon, though we see a corridor that extends down into the northern Gulf Coast states, so-called Dixie Tornado Alley. It's the same sort of thing with the cluster right movers. They're much more common in the areas where tornadoes are most common. So they're, it's not an accident that where supercells tend to occur, that's where tornadoes tend to occur. Now, the difference with the central United States compared to the southeast and the Midwest is what happens with the QLCS tornadoes. We don't have nearly as many linear convective modes in the Great Plains as we do, com relatively speaking, in the uh, southeast and the Midwest. And this is largely in the cool season. Occasionally bleeds over into the spring. And then we have other sort of a hybrid where there are supercell structures in lines. So you can see as you move, the plains tend to be dominated by supercells. 
and then it tends to be more of an even distribution as you go east toward the Mississippi Valley. You can add these together and just, uh, in, in some sense, if you, you know, wonder why people like the storm chase in the plains, the discrete and cluster right movers, which are the types of storms you could go out and look at, they're clustered mostly in the central Great Plains. Oklahoma, Kansas is the max. So you could expect almost every other year a tornadic storm to go somewhere close to you, which I guess that's good if you like to go out and look at them. You don't have to drive as far. But the same sort of frequency extends down into Dixie Alley. The big difference is just there are more linear type modes to the east. So tornadoes are just as frequent in the Mississippi Valley. It's just they tend to be more of a wide distribution of modes. And you can even see here, like northeast Colorado, that's a smooth version of the Denver Cyclone with the non-mesocyclonic non tornadoes and the disorganized storms that form in that convergence zone. And you can look at relative frequencies. Again, the main takeaway here is the discrete and right movers. Western Oklahoma, big shock, about 80% of all the tornadic storms are discrete or cluster right moving supercells. So you don't have, there's not a big mess of different types of modes, but look over toward Indiana, it's somewhere in the order of 40 to 50%. So that means almost half of the tornado producing storms are something other than just typical supercells. And then we can break this down by season. So that's the advantage of having a big data set like this. The spring tornado season, which we know are with supercells, focuses out in the central plains. Again, saying a little bit earlier, but similar time frame. This is March, April, May is what we're using as spring down into Dixie Alley. Shifts north in the summer to the northern plains, parts of the upper Midwest, and then drops back down to the Gulf Coast, lower Mississippi Valley in the fall and the winter. So you can see the seasonal, uh, wandering of the uh, supercell tornado threat. And again, this is nothing particularly earth shattering. It's just now we can look at the spatial pattern of it, not just we know tornadoes are more common in the northern plains, but what do we mean? I mean, how much more common are they near, say, Fargo, North Dakota, compared to Lincoln, Illinois, for example? QLCS tornadoes, again, it's mostly the cooler half of the year where they're a little bit more common. But again, you see some signal in the summer where thunderstorms are more common in the upper Midwest, but it's primarily Mississippi and Ohio Valley in the spring and some signal in the winter. And the tornadoes are generally just not as common in the fall. All right, we have variations of the storms themselves. That just kind of gives you a base idea of what the climatology of the events looks like. Now let's look at what the spatial distribution of the ingredients related to supercell tornadoes. How do they vary? Are there regional signals there? So we're gonna only look at tornado environments and compare QLCS events to right moving supercells. We're not gonna worry about the disorganized storms. And we're gonna use the significant tornado parameter ingredient. So essentially the things we've talked about before, ML cape, the fixed layer, zero to six kilometer bulk wind difference, zero to one fixed layer storm relative velocity, LCL height for the 100 millibar mean parcel, and then the combination in the fixed layer significant tornado parameter. So we have a lot of this information for the right moving supercells. We're gonna compare how it varies seasonally and across modes. Okay, so this is what it looks like, a standard box and whisker plot for the right moving supercells. And this would be the winter, spring, summer, fall. You see a clear seasonal increase in Cape. It's much more common as we get into the spring and fall. So the biggest Cape is in the summer, not too shocking. It's not in the spring. It's, that's kind of in between in terms of buoyancy and it's minimized in the winter and the fall. So nothing too surprising there. Now we compare it to the QLCS tornadoes, so that's the overlay here. Notice the buoyancy tends to be a lot weaker, especially in the winter. There's not a tremendous amount of overlap in those distributions. The QLCS tornadoes tend to occur in much lower Cape environments. It's not that QLCS tornadoes favor low Cape. I think what this really tells you is that you need larger buoyancy to get the supercells. You just don't tend to get very many supercells when you get down into this fumes for buoyancy 100 or 200 ml cape. It's hard to sustain tornadic supercells in that environment in the, because these are also characterized by strong vertical shear, which I'm going to show coming up. So again, buoyancy tends to be weaker, but it follows a similar seasonal increase. Okay, we do the same thing LCL height. No big surprise. It gets 
Cape goes up, but it gets hotter. Dew points, you know, tend to have a limit. They don't just keep going up into the 80s and the 90s everywhere. There are limits to the water temperatures. It tends to get hot inland. So LCL heights are relatively high in the summer, comparatively speaking, and they're lowest in the winter when the temperatures are coolest. QLCS tornado environments look really similar. There's no big difference. So they tend to occur in lower buoyancy, but similar temperature dew point spreads or LCL heights. Now, if we look at the uh, bulk wind differences, this is just like the deep layer shear for supercells. In this case, nothing uh, that would stand out. I mean, these are significant tornado producing uh, supercells, so they're well over the, that 30 to 40 knot range. It's well up into the supercell part of the parameter space in the winter, spring, and fall. A little bit more marginal in the summer, but still typical of broad sample supercell environments. QLCS, on the other hand, they actually tend to be stronger deep layer shear in the winter, weaker deep layer shear in the summer, and then sort of a little bit more overlap in a transition in the transition seasons. And then we go to low level shear, storm relative felicity related to the potential for low level updraft rotation, the pressure perturbation, that whole feedback process. Here, again, Vertical shear tends to be stronger, even low levels and deep layer with QLCS tornado environments. In the winter, they're very similar in the spring, fairly similar in the summer, maybe slightly weaker. So they're, and then very similar in the fall. So you, you can see there are some seasonal variations, the most noteworthy of which is be the buoyancy being lower and the deep layer shear being weaker as you get into the summer. And then when we combine these, you notice the spring, it didn't have the strongest vertical shear, it didn't have the largest buoyancy, but it doesn't have a weakness in any of the parameters. So the storm significant tornado parameter is maximized, especially on the high end. It's much more noticeable in the spring. The high end environments are largely confined to the spring. And then you see in general significant tornado producing supercells, they're mostly well over the threshold, rough threshold of one. QLCS tornado environments, tend to be more down in the threshold range, and this is largely because weaker buoyancy. Some of it in the summer is due to also weaker deep layer vertical shear. All right, well that, that's just sort of the seasonal lump everything together. What does it look like spatially? So we're gonna look at this in a manner that's similar to what we did for the actual tornado reports. And we're gonna, again, same comparison, right moving supercells to QLCS, same parameters. Now we're just gonna look at how they vary spatially and by season. Okay, so here is the full spatial distribution. Now, this one is, if you think of, like at every point, we did a box and whisker plot, and then we plot like the, what the bottom of the whisker looks like, what those values would be, the median, and the top whisker. So the low values, kind of the middle of the distribution, and the top, this is what it looks like spatially. So if we go over here, 90th percentile buoyancy environments, three, 4,000 plus cape, that's high end cape for a tornadic supercell. And this is just lumping all the tornadic supercells together, weak tor, significant tornadoes. And you notice that you can see that even where the tornadoes are occurring, they tend to be lower cape. So you compare the QLCS, low end cape, 500 to 1,000. That's low end for a tornadic supercell. Low end here, since we start the contouring at 500, you don't even see it. They're well below that. So again, there are some clear, very, and notice that you can see the spatial concentration of storms in the plains. Notice you don't see as many values as far west. That's a reflection of there just not being that many QLCS tornado reports on the high plains. And so we just highlight that area. Again, we can go through the same comparison. We get the ML LCL heights. Again, you notice the difference they t on the high end. Mostly these are weak tornado producing storms where higher LCLs are worse, they actually get up into the 1500 to 2000 range, which is fairly high. Something like the significant tornado parameter, that red shaded area would knock that out. That would be set to zero because the values are above 2000 meters. Again, these are all tornadoes with supercells. It could be a little weak dirt whirly all the way up to a 100 mile track violent tornado. They're all just lumped together here. Again, QLCS, LCL heights are much lower they don't tend to get very high for any of the environments, and there's a dearth of, in, of the events over the high plains. Zero to six kilometer bulk wind difference. This is where, if you remember the box and whisker plots nationally overlaid pretty well, pretty much similar distribution. 
Supercells just occur in a bigger area more frequently with tornadoes, but if you notice the colors are pretty similar, they're similar range of values. It's just highlighting this one's not a good discriminator. This isn't going to tell you what convective mode is going to be the outcome because the, they all look like supercell environments. SRH, same kind of thing. Now, we are assuming a right moving supercell storm motion, but another way to look at this is it's based purely on the wind profile, so really it is a reflection of the wind profile because we're doing the same thing to the wind profile, the same assumed propagation and fraction of the off the shear vector through the mean wind, which is the bunkers technique. So we're just doing the same thing. If you were to just use the mean wind, whichever motion you want, the relative patterns will look the same. So you do, the only reason you have to pay attention to the storm motion is just so that you compare apples to apples. And then when we do STP, really the thing that stands out is that the supercell environments, this is where the cape tends to overlap with the, deep, the vertical shear, especially in the low levels, and there's bigger values are more common in significant tornado environments, which is what this high end of the distribution really represents. And if you focus on just this area, we'll look at it. The two primary drivers of STP, if you just look, it's basically the east part of the larger buoyancy climatologically, the west part of the stronger lullable shear, and that's where STP is maximized. And if you remember from the climatology of, of tornadoes, it's in that exact same corridor. So this tells you we're on the right path. We're not maximizing ingredients in one place and events in another. It's that when supercells are occurring, and especially higher end tornadoes are occurring, it's in the same place where the ingredients are most favorable. All right, we'll look at just uh, real quick how to put some of this in perspective. A couple of, maybe three cases here. This is uh, courtesy of Scott Blair. It's the Bowdle tornado from May 22, 2010 up in South Dakota. It was a nice tornado that I didn't see. So somebody getting interested in the background, but no, I missed this when I was at work. The, here's just a radar view, because we're going to look at a lot more radar stuff coming up. Uh, classic supercell, strong velocity couplet with the appendage. It's in the high reflectivity area. We'll talk about that more in the upcoming presentations. But what we can do on the SPC mesoanalysis page, you can, instead of trying to memorize this vast array of climatological information, I mean, I, I don't even have it memorized. I've been, I made the plots and I've been looking at it for a decade. I don't have it memorized. Good thing here is you can just point and click on the map. We pull that same information up and do a form of a box and whisker plot, except these are just horizontally oriented, so we can fit them on there. It's just a, a different way of doing it. In the little pink bar that you see here, that's just what the current values are based on the time that you actually generate the plot. So what we do is we'll look at Bowdle. We'll actually go through the ingredients and plot where it was in terms of the climatological distribution for the area right around northeast South Dakota. So if you look at, in this case, the, we've got the, uh, it's, here the cape is way on the high end. Compared to normal, it's above the 90th percentile, so you're in the upper end of the distribution. The same thing on the shear, it's kind of upper percentile effective bulk wind difference. These are the effective layer STP ingredients, just so it tells you a similar story. LCL heights, middle, lower end of the distribution, so no problem there. And then you've got effective storm relative felicity, about 75th percentile. When you combine all that, it's way in the upper percentiles. It's near the maximum value for STP for that part of the country. Okay, so we can look at another, here's another one you might be familiar with, the Tuscaloosa tornado from April 27th of 2011. Again, a long track high-end tornadic storm. Sort of, a, this is what we call a cluster supercell based on our radar analysis. Extremely strong velocity couplet. It's tied for the strongest one that we have over the period that we've examined. That's a rotational velocity of 124 knots, so a peak-to-peak -peak velocity difference of 248 knots across the couplet when you get down on the individual gate level. Okay, where does this one fall? You, you can imagine this was the kind of a generational outbreak. You would think this one's going to look pretty impressive. So again, we look, cape up around the 90th percentile, effective shear, 75th percentile, LCL low. Now, they tend to be low all the time in the southeast, but it's favorably low, SRH, 75th percentile. Again, STP above the 90th. So this is a high-end environment. 
with no clear weaknesses. And again, the advantage of this approach is you don't have to memorize what's Big Cape for Northern Alabama. I mean, I, I might be able to sort of tell you that, but you don't have to memorize it. You can just poke around and we've done all the statistical junk in the background. And then here's one you may not be familiar with, just to show that in, you know, there's many places and scenarios you can use this. Uh, EF2 damage on the rim in Arizona in October in the morning in 2010. So this is around seven to nine in the morning local time. Not exactly climatology, but if you get the environment, it doesn't matter. Here's the storm. It's the one, it's actually, I think it was this one embedded. So a supercell cluster, reason, not super strong velocity coupler, moderately strong. And then let's look at this and, okay, Cape, we're talking the rim in Arizona. We don't have a lot of tornadic supercells there, but this is relatively high in buoyancy for the few events that occur. The shear term, it's on the upper end. LCL way down on the low end. I mean, you're, just, you're at higher elevation, but you're just off the lower desert. So you would think that LCL might be a limiting factor pretty commonly, and it is. SRH, way on the high end. STP, while not, you know, this is nothing that's gonna impress you compared to the two previous cases, but it's near the top of the distribution for the rim country in Arizona. So again, another way to keep this in perspective without having to memorize a million different numbers. So we'll just summarize. We do have clear regional variations in these, and they vary between, some of the parameters vary, some don't. They vary by mode, they vary by region. And again, the Cape LCL on the plains tends to be the one that stands out the most. In the vertical shear, other than a slight tendency for stronger low-level shear toward the Mississippi-Tennessee Valley region, it's uniformly strong across both tornadic environments over broad areas.